Thank you, and good morning, Citizens Church. It's, it's really good to be with you this morning, whether you're here in person or, or joining us online. My name is Dave, and I'm a member of Citizens Church, and I also work with the Acts 29 Church Planting Network, in which Citizens is a member. And uh, it's really good to, to be with you today. If you have a Bible, let me encourage you to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to look at uh, verses 14 through 16. I, uh, I received a troubling text from a friend lately. He was commi- communicating to me his decision to step away from the church. Uh, he simply texted me these words. He said, I want to live and enjoy Jesus, enjoy my family. The American church is broken. And with that, he stepped away officially from the local church. This wasn't just someone who was mildly involved in, 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 in church life. This was someone who was an elder in the church, and not just an elder, but at one point in time, a lead pastor of a very significant church that had an influential role in, a, in, a, in another city. And as he shared that text with me, I, I, was, I was disappointed, obviously. I don't know that there's really a space, scripturally, where we can step away from the church and not in some way step away from Jesus as well, but I couldn't disagree with his assessment. The American church is broken. As a matter of fact, probably the church globally is, is broken in some ways. All we have to do is listen to podcasts and look at blogs and look at headlines to say there's something not entirely right with the church. I want to ask us this morning as we look at this passage a challenging question. I want to ask the question that may be uncomfortable for you, why? Why the church? And I don't mean why does it exist, but I mean why should we be invested why should we be involved? It's not always fun to ask this. It feels very self-serving. Perhaps it is. What, what's, what's in it for us? As we look at this passage of Scripture today, why the church, we're going to get three compelling reasons why, she, why we should be a part of the church. And then I, I don't want to conclude our time today without talking about those who are distancing themselves from the church. You probably have family members and friends and neighbors and loved ones who have chosen the same path. I'm not ditching Jesus, but... I'm saying goodbye to the church. What do we do with folks like that? I'm so glad you're here today. We're continuing our series that we've entitled Belonging, where we're covering our our basic core beliefs at Citizens Church. These are the things that we say are really important to us, so much so that we confess them and we we bind ourselves together as a body based on these truths. And today, we're going to talk about the church. Let me give you the definition that we have for the church according to our doctrine here at Citizens. It's real simple. It's simply this. We believe that the church consists of all who have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ for their eternal salvation and is sent into the world to shine forth the glory of God. Why the church? What's in it for us? Why should you, why should I, why should we be involved and invested in the church? That's the question we're going to tackle this morning. Let's pray, though, before we do so. Father, thank you for every woman, every man, every boy, every girl, every young person in this room this morning. This meeting is not by accident. You've called this gathering, Father. And according to the Lord Jesus, you called it because you're seeking those who will worship you in spirit and truth. And Father, for those of us who've placed our faith in Jesus, that's exactly what we want the next few minutes to be together, even as we open up your word, that it would indeed be an act of worship. Jesus, thank you that you being eternally God, you humbled yourself. You became a man. And you walked this world that we live in. And you're the only one ever who lived a perfect life. And Lord Jesus, you, blameless and without error and without sin, you went to the cross to die in our place. And Lord Jesus, the grave couldn't contain you. You were risen physically and bodily. You're at the right hand of the Father. And we know Jesus. We know Perhaps very soon, you're going to come back. And when you do, you're going to make everything that's wrong right, and we will be with you forever. We pray that our time together today, that we would do more than just esteem the church, that, Lord Jesus, we would esteem you, the head of the church. God the Father and God the Son, thank you for God the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, meet us where we are today. I pray for those who are devoted to the church, that they would be encouraged. I pray for those that are slowly distancing themselves from the church, they would be exhorted. Holy Spirit, I pray for those who perhaps are are listening in some form or some facet today who are watching, who don't even know Jesus, that today you would arrange an introduction, 
that lives would be changed, that, that people would be transformed and Jesus would be made much of. In his good name, we all pray together. Amen. First Timothy 3, we're going to jump in at verse 14. Why the church? What's in it for us? Why should you and I be involved in the life of the church? Let me read the text for you together. Uh, let's read it. I'll read it for you. You, you follow along. I'll read it. First Timothy 3, 14. I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. I want to stop there. Before I go any further, I really want to orient you to this text today, because if I don't, I don't think it'll have the same impact. I want you to know what came before this and what follows this specific text. The Apostle Paul has written this letter to Timothy, who's been sent by the Apostle Paul to fix a doctrinal problem in the church at Ephesus. And the two chapters that preceded the the, the text we look at today were all about how we do church. It was this idea of when you gather together, this is what a gathering should look like. And then as we move, that's chapter two, as we move into 1 Timothy 3, we get this sense of who God's leaders in the church should be. The type of quality and character that, that elders and deacons have. And then we come to this point. Now, I want you to know what follows this because it's equally important. As soon as we get done with the verses we're going to look at, the Apostle Paul tells Timothy, some people are going to leave. Some people aren't going to stay with the church. Some people are going to ditch their faith. Some people are going to move on and follow things outside of Jesus. So I think in many ways, this text is always relevant, but it's so timely to where we are today. Let's look at the three descriptions of the church because I think in them, we're going to be compelled to answer the question why we should be involved in the church. Look at that first description of the church. The church is the household of God. The church is the household of God. When you and I think of the term household in modern days, we we oftentimes think of a structure, right? You think in terms of the apartment you live in or the the condo you you, you have or, or the home you own. It's not really what it means in the ancient world. Your household in the ancient world was your immediate family. And then because oftentimes you had businesses that were run out of your home. You, you also had employees. Some of them were indentured servants and they were considered to be part of your household. Uh, you probably had generations living in your household. So when you and I see this term household, I want you to think in terms of family. Now look at the text again. To whom does this family, this household belong to? They are of whom? God. What a beautiful picture of the church. As a matter of fact, of all the images that we get of the church in the Bible, that's my favorite. We're a family. I love family. We're a family. We're a great big family that consists of everyone everywhere who professes the name of Jesus. We're a family. Here's, if you're taking notes, here's, there's going to be three points because all sermons have to have three points. Here's point one. Why the church? Here's why. As the church, we live as God's people. We're his family. You're my sister, I'm your brother. God is our father. And he's not like our earthly fathers because he perfectly loves us and he perfectly accepts us on the basis of what Jesus has done and who he is. Jesus is our big brother. He's the first of of many and we've been adopted in and we're one big family. And as any family desires to do that wants to be a healthy family, we wanna do life together. Maybe you're thinking about your own family today. Maybe you're thinking about starting a family. I know some of you perhaps aren't married yet. Maybe you're married and you don't have children. When you think of your family, no one ever thinks or dreams of her family, his family, and says, you know, I hope we're disconnected someday. I really hope we don't spend a lot of time together. I'd hate for us to gather together around meals. I really don't think it's important that we get together on a weekly basis. When you and I dream of our families, or we pray for our existing families, what do we want? We want close relationships in which we do life together. As the church, we live as God's people. You're a part of a family. Um, This December will be 35 years of being married to my lovely wife, Kara. It's been nothing but wonderful for me and it's been nothing but struggle for her, but here we are. And uh, I think back all the time on the week we got married. So we were students at Texas Tech University, Reckham. Yeah, thank you. Guns up. Appreciate that. First service wasn't quite as enthusiastic, so I guess Red Raiders sleep in or something. I don't know what it is, but I'm glad to hear that. And uh, uh, fall term ended. 
we had a few days before we were to get married, First Baptist Church, Lubbock, Texas. My parents had come into town, Kara's parents had come into town, planning the wedding, grandparents had come, some close family relatives came into town, and then uh, what often is the case in West Texas in December, a blue norther blows through and dumps a bunch of snow and there's blizzard-like conditions and we get confined to the luxurious hotel, Embassy Suites, in Lubbock, Texas for a week. And there's nothing to do but to hang out and tell stories and play games and tell more stories and eat whatever we can scrounge together and tell more stories. And I got to tell you, it was awesome. I loved it. And I began to realize what was going to happen as we got married. Not only were two people committing the rest of their lives together and God was making a union of two, I wasn't just committing the rest of my life to Kara. God was bringing two families together. Do you see that's what happened when you came to faith in Jesus? One of the beautiful pictures we get in Scripture is when, when, we, are, when we are brought into a faith relationship with God through Jesus, we have union with Jesus. We are connected to him. He abides in us through the Holy Spirit. His life is our life. His death, our death, his resurrection, someday will be our resurrection too. But we're not only united just with Jesus, we're brought into his family. You're not alone today. As a matter of fact, anywhere you go on the face of the earth, you're going to have family. As the church, we live as God's people. Let me ask you a question this morning that's pertinent. Are you engaging with God's people? Are you engaging with God's people? When we talk about Citizens Church and we think about spiritual formation, and that's different language for saying what we want to do in our relationship with Jesus. We want to grow together to be as mature as we possibly can be in Jesus. There's three realms of spiritual formation. One of them is communities. Are you invested in a community here at Citizens Church? Do you have a home group? Are you involved with the young adults? Are you involved in student ministry? Are you involved in any way that you are spending regular time with your family doing life together as God's people? It doesn't have to be formally also, only. Are you informal? Do you get together over meals? Do you pray together? Do you hang out together? Are you engaging with God's people? As the church, we live as God's people. Let's look at the second picture we have here. Not only are we the household of God, we are the church of the living God. I want to explain what that means. This idea of the church in ancient times was the idea of an assembly or, or, or a subgroup of people being called together specifically to gather together. It's this picture that we get in the Bible that God is making for himself a people from all tongues, all tribes, all nations, all walks of life. And ultimately, at the end of the day, God is doing that so that he might be among them. We see that in Genesis, don't we? As God created Adam and Eve, he walked with them. He created them to be in relationship with him. As the book of Revelation closes, we see that all those uh, that are left with God are enjoying him forever, and God will be their God and will dwell among them. So we're a gathering. We're a people that are called out, that are brought together, that are assembling. And we're assembling for the sake of, according to this text, the living God. Whenever you see that language in scripture, I want you to think in terms of a God who is personable. He's not, he's not detached from us. He's not distant. He's not merely looking on to see what will happen. He is actively, personally engaged with us. He's active, and guess what? More than anything else, he's present. Did you think about that when you came in this morning? It blows my mind every time I think about it, and I try to think about it before we begin. Sometimes I do better than others. God is with us. Think about that. When we come together here today, it's not just us, although that's great. It's us and the very presence of God is among us. Second thing I want you to see as to why the church. Why? why, why what's in it for us? Why, why should we be invested and involved in the church? Here's the second thing I want you to see. As the church, we live in God's presence. As the church, we live in God's presence. In other words, what the Bible teaches is we come together formally as the church, God is present with us in a way that's unique, in a way that's distinct, in a way that's powerful, more so than it was just you and I meeting alone with God. Now, God is always present with us. As a matter of fact, God is present everywhere. God indwells every believer through the person of God, the Holy Spirit. But when we come together, 
the presence of God is manifest in ways that are unique and different and wonderful and exciting and energizing and incredible. Amen? And I want to be really careful what I say next because I know some of you are only able to join us online today and I'm so grateful that you're with us. I don't know about you, I hated the live stream. Anybody else? Now, I was serving at the time when, when the pandemic shutdown happened. I was serving as the campus pastor of the Village Church Fort Worth. And the only thing worse in my mind of having to listen to my voice preach on audio is actually having to watch myself on video. Like, I'm sorry today already. I've seen myself. I'm sorry. There must be a lot of grace in this room for you to put up with me. So imagine this scenario. And in Fort Worth, we didn't have the ability to live stream, so we pre-recorded. But we pretended like it was a live stream. So it was doubly fake. But anyway, we, 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 we got together and I'd preach a sermon to an empty room and then the musicians would do their best. We'd pre-record it then Sunday morning. Sunday morning, we'd release it as a live stream. And I remember my, my mom and dad were living with us at the time. And so me and Kara, my mom and dad would sit in comfortable chairs as best we could in, in our casual Sunday clothes. And we would listen to music and we would sing the best we could, which wasn't really great other than Kara. And then when it came time for the sermon to begin, I would pretend that I was having a coughing fit or needed the restroom and I would leave and it just wasn't great. It just wasn't great at all. But I remember the first time we could regather. Do you remember what that was like here at Citizens? The first time we could regather, everybody's masked up, so you really can't tell what people are feeling. I, I remember coming up to the pulpit and the first time we regathered and I just couldn't speak. I was so filled with joy. It was, it was awkward. I cried like a sloppy cry. When I cry, I don't speak through crying very well. I have that kind of a Dudley Do-Right voice. It goes, ah, you know, it gets really weird. But as I looked across the faces in the room, smiles, remember how we learned to smile with our eyes during the COVID? Like, I'm smiling, I'm really happy. Tears, incredible joy. Why is that? Because in the presence of God, what we feel more often than not is not just awe, but a sense of what? He's our God. He loves us. He created us for the very purpose that he might be with us, that we might worship him and enjoy him forever. And guess what? We're with him now, all of us together. Are you enjoying the presence of God? Are you engaging in the gatherings? Oh, I want you to be here. And I know there's good reasons. I'm not trying to be legalistic. I know there are very good reasons of why you can't be here every Sunday. I get it. You need a vacation. And yes, if you, if you have a communicable disease, you probably shouldn't be here. That might not be great. And occasionally things happen in your life that just prevent you from being here. But would you come? Would you come and gather with us? Because something unique happens when we come together. When we come together as the church, Jesus is present with us in a very unique way. Jesus said it this way in Matthew 18. He said, where two or three of you are gathered in my name, there I am also. Jesus wasn't establishing the minimum number of attendees that needed to be there for him to like, hey, if it's just one of you, it's not worth my time, but two or three, I'm there. That's not what he's saying at all. What he's talking about in Matthew 18 is the church formally gathered. And he's saying, when you come together as the church in my name, I'm with you. Now we know that Jesus is physically, bodily raised. He's at the right hand of the Father. So how can Jesus be with us? He's with us through the person of the Holy Spirit, the one that scripture refers to as the Spirit of Christ. Church, God is with us. Are you enjoying his presence? Here's something that's really troubling to me today. As we begin to research dwindling numbers in the church in America, and particularly in attendance on Sunday, we're learning something very interesting. When we see our attendance declining, this isn't happening at Citizens, but it's happening a lot of places. What we're learning is it's not people are leaving the church never to come back, they're just not as regular in attendance as they used to be. So now maybe rather than two Sundays a month, or the kind of one every other month. Oh, let me encourage you. As the church, we live in God's presence. Are you enjoying his presence? Do you come when you come, whether it's at 9 or 11.15 or on September 4th, 11? When you come, do you come with expectation? Do you come prepared? Do you come ready to experience the presence of God with the people of God? Are you ready to be joyful. Are you ready to enjoy him? One last image we have to look at, and this one's the most difficult to figure out. We're going to move from images of people to architectural images. So 
Not only is the church, uh, as a church we live as God's people, not only as a church do we live in God's presence, here's the third picture we have of the church from the end of verse 15. It's a pillar and foundation or buttress of the truth. Structural language. And the idea of a pillar and a buttress or a foundation is they're supportive structures. So there's purpose in the church that we exist to support, to uphold, I like to think of it in terms of to both proclaim and practice the truth of God. The church is not the source of truth. There are traditions in Christian history that have said the church is the source of truth. We don't believe that to be true. As we've already enumerated and uh, hopefully communicated to you through this series, the truth of God is expressed through the word of God. But the church exists to uphold, to support, to proclaim and practice the truth of God. Here's the third thing I want you to think about. As the church, we live out God's purpose, which is being sent into a world that's void of truth, that's dark, and to live as a light, shining on the truth, supporting the truth by proclaiming and practicing the truth. As the church, we live out God's purpose. It may raise a question in your mind as to, then what is the truth? Is there anywhere, Dave, in Scripture that succinctly communicates the truth of all of Scripture? Well, I'm glad you asked that because I think it's in this little chorus that follows. Look at this. This is amazing. Go back, if you will, to 1 Timothy 3, 15. I don't know if this was a hymn they sing in the early church or a poem that they all memorized. I don't know if it was on the, the walls of children's ministry. I don't know what it was, but it was important to them. And listen to it. It's all about Jesus. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. Mystery in the Bible doesn't mean something that we'll never understand. It means something that was previously hidden that's now been revealed. And what Paul is saying here is the things that were previously misunderstood or wouldn't seen have been fulfilled in Jesus. And here's what we believe about Jesus. Ready? Jesus, he was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. The summary of the truth that we exist to proclaim and to practice is all about Jesus. That's the very essence of the Bible. The Bible is not a thousand principles to live by. It's one person to live for. His name is Jesus. And we see three dimensions to the ministry of Jesus that are critically important here. First, we see what we call his incarnation. Jesus came in the flesh. That's amazing. We, we don't worship a God who's detached from us. We don't worship a God who's distant from us. We don't, uh, we don't worship a God who understands us in principle, but not practically. We worship a God who walked among us. According to scripture, who was like us in every way, except the most significant way he was different, he was without sin. Jesus was manifested in the flesh. Guess what? The news gets even better. He was vindicated by the Spirit. So we not only proclaim the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ, we proclaim his resurrection. That's what it means. It's this idea that Jesus died in our place as our substitute, offering himself up in our place, atoning for us before God the Father. And the fact that God the Father accepted Jesus' sacrifice is made evident through the resurrection of Jesus, which was carried out by God the Holy Spirit. So when we come together, we proclaim and we, we support both in the things we proclaim and the things we practice, the incarnation, the resurrection of Jesus. Guess what? It gets even better. Not only that, he's ascended into glory. He's our Savior. He's our Lord. He's the King of kings and Lord of lords. And you and I, as the church, are sent into a world where there's way too much information and way little truth. And we get to live out God's purpose of being witnesses to Jesus. Yes, he came. He lived in the flesh and he died in your place and he's risen from the dead and he's ascended into heaven. And one day he'll come back and he'll take everything that's wrong and make it right and we will be with him forever. We're sent with that message. We get to be light in the darkness. Now, how does that play out? What does that look like today? Let me give you one example. I came across a, 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 uh, a study the other day, a poll. You ever see polls that sometimes just make you scratch your head and think, ah, that seems so weird to me, and then sometimes you're like, yeah, I saw that coming. This is one we all saw coming. 
2,000 Americans were recently surveyed. 52% of Americans wake up every day feeling imminent danger for their own lives. 52% of us wake up every day and think, I'm in danger, like physical danger, like I may die today. If you track the demographics, if you're in the age demographic of 25 to 34, 75% of you feel like you're in imminent danger. And you don't even have to leave your home. This was true whether the person worked at home, never left their home, or, or, or rode motorcycles. Either way, people just felt this sense of, oh no, I'm in imminent danger. We live in a culture of fear. You can feel it, can't you? When you walk out these doors, you just feel it. Man, everybody's so uptight. Everybody's so afraid. Do you realize that the truth that we serve as a, as a pillar and a foundation has the antidote for fear? Do you see that? That we have good news. That we can be reconciled with God through Jesus. And that means more than just us having a right relationship with God. There's so many promises that come with that. Let me give you an example. It's the, the phrase that we use a lot here when we talk at Citizens. We talk about enjoying God, love people. That third statement there, that third phrase, make disciples, that comes from something we call the Great Commission. I want you to see how the Great Commission is the antidote for fear. Because if we look at the make disciples piece, I want you to think of your favorite sandwich, like that's the meat in the middle. But there's two slices of bread, not like cheap bread, but like homemade baked bread that, that frame the make disciples. Jesus says two things before he tells us to go into the world to make disciples. You can look at this later in Matthew 28. You know what the first thing he says is? All authority has been given to me on heaven and on earth. In other words, after Jesus was raised from the dead, before he ascended into heaven, he tells his disciples that to go out and take his message to the world, all authority is mine. There's nothing that happens on heaven and earth that I don't decree, that I don't oversee, that I'm not in charge of. Wow. That's big news. Then comes the Great Commission and the second slice of bread at the bottom. You know what he says at the very end? And I'm with you forever to the end of the age. So Jesus says to us today, because of the fact that we're reconciled with him through his work, Jesus says, all authority is mine. And then he ascends into heaven and he exercises it. All authority is mine. There's nothing you're going to face in your life that isn't flow through my hands. And guess what? When it gets tough, when it gets scary, and it will, I'm with you to the end of the age. And what comes at the end of age? He makes all things right and we're with him forever. Wow. I grew up in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I know some of you are from Albuquerque. And uh, when I was a kid, my dad owned a full-service car wash. It was near Old Town Albuquerque, Old Route 66, and it was cleverly named Old Town Car Wash. And I remember one time, my dad taking me through his car wash early in the morning before any cars came through and all the employees were assembled. And he held my hand and we walked through the, the, the lane of the car wash without everything going on. And when you're a little kid, I was probably four or five at the time, like 1970, that's intimidating. Like huge brushes and hoses and soap dispensers and, and conveyor belts. And to make matters worse, his entire staff was made up of hippies. Now, I know when we think of hippies today, they're like cute and benign, like bunnies. When you're four years old, they're scary. Like the men look and smell like monsters, and the women look like pirates. So we walk into this car wash with all the machinery and all the people lined up, and my dad takes me by the hand, and we just walk through the whole thing like we're a car being washed. Can I tell you what never entered my heart? Fear. Why? Because my dad's in charge. See, his car wash. He has authority over the machines and the hippies and everyone else. And he's with me. Do you see our calling? We are called into the world with a very specific purpose in mind. As God's people, as the church, we live out God's purpose, which is to be a support, a supporting structure to the truth the good news, the gospel of Jesus, and we get to proclaim that and we get to practice that. Let me ask you this morning, are you embracing God's purpose for your life in the church? Let me encourage you to do something very practically. There's some amazing classes that are offered here at Citizens Church. 
whether it's men's study, the women's study, or steps, or other courses you can take. There, there's even seminars that happen occasionally. I'm sure there's more that I don't even know about. And it's, it's really hard to be a supporter of the truth if you don't know the truth. So I want to encourage you, as, as we begin to head towards fall, be involved in a class. Study, are you embracing God's purpose? So, why the church? The three compelling reasons that I think we see from this text. As the church, we live as God's people. As the church, we live in God's presence. And as the church, we live out God's purpose. Now, what about those who are disillusioned? What about those who aren't with us today because they're distancing themselves from their faith and the church? Worse yet, what about those that are deconstructing? What do we do? I bet even as I'm sharing that with you, probably everyone in this room has someone that comes to mind immediately, true? A friend, a family member, a coworker, a neighbor, someone maybe used to be in home group with, maybe someone used to serve with in kids' ministry. What do we do with folks like that? I want us to go back to this text one last time, and I want us to focus on two aspects of Jesus, because I think the best thing we can do is we can point them to Jesus. I don't think we need to defend the integrity of the church. I think instead we need to turn people towards Jesus and say, look again at him. Now, what do we do? Do we just have them read all the red letters in the Bible? No, I suggest we use this hymn and this foundation. Particularly through his incarnation, we find sympathy. And then through his resurrection and ascension, we find victory. Let me ask you a really significant question this morning. Of all the people who've ever lived on the face of the earth, who do you think is most in tune with the failure of the people of Jesus? Jesus is. And Jesus is sympathetic to those who've been wounded, hurt, and abused by the church. He gets it. It was his experience. Let me read a passage for you just to make sure in case you don't believe me. Hebrews 4. This is who Jesus is, our great high priest. Hebrews 4, verse 14. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. Here we go. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Jesus knows his church is broken. He sees it. He's not blind to reality. He's not Pollyannic in his perspective. He sees that people have been wounded by his people. See, see, here's the problem with the church. It's twofold. The church consists of sinners. That's problematic. Brace for the bad news. Guess who leads the church as human beings? Sinners. And so my friend says, I'm leaving the church because the church is broken. I can at least agree to him, yeah, it is broken. And for those that are hurt by the church, wounded by the church, abused by the church, struggle with the church, Jesus is sympathetic. He knows what that feels like. Let me give you a couple examples from Bible. Luke 9, you can look at this later. Luke 9 is an amazing chapter. Incredible things happen in the lives of the followers of Jesus. They see the transfiguration. One of them finally says, hey, we know who you are. You're the Christ. Great. And then Jesus is coming down the mountain with a few that got to participate in the transfiguration, and he encounters a man who's desperate. This man's only child, little boy, is tormented by an evil spirit. And as Jesus comes down the mountain to meet up with his other disciples, this man says to Jesus, I brought him to your disciples. They couldn't do anything about him. Or for him. You know what Jesus says? How long do I got to put up with you guys? He's not talking to everybody else. He's talking to his own followers. How long? You're so faithless. How long must I? Think about what it must have been like after the resurrection of Jesus when his disciples go back and some of them write the Bible. Some of them read it like, wow, that was a really bad day. Remember that day when Jesus said, how much longer? Because he knew what was in front of him. Was Jesus in essence saying, I wish I could get to the cross sooner because this is miserable. Jesus understands. Jesus is sympathetic. 
Well, you might think, well, that's all before the cross. After the cross, everything changed. Everything did change. But the people of God were still flawed. Case in point, look at Revelation 2 and 3 sometime. Jesus writes specific instructions to seven churches. The majority of them have significant issues that he's not pleased with. So much so that in one instance, he at least says, if you don't repent, I'm going to take away your lampstand. In other words, if you don't turn around and come back to me, then you will no longer have a witness on my behalf in this community. Jesus sees the church as it is. He loves the church perfectly, but he sees the church in her brokenness. And for those who've been wounded by the church, Jesus comes alongside you. He understands from his own experience and he's sympathetic towards you. Please hear me. I'm not justifying that we continue down the bad path as a church. There's no place in the church among leaders for those who are abusers and predators. Absolutely none. But the church is broken. The church isn't all that she will be. But here's what you need to know about Jesus. That's not his only perspective. He doesn't just see the church as it presently is. There's two other perspectives he has. One is the church in its position. In her position, as God the Father looks through his eyes at the church, he sees the church in Christ. So positionally we are, despite the fact that we're sinners, we're justified, we're righteous, we're blameless, and we're pure positionally. And then the day will come when Jesus will perfect his church. Oh, can you hold on until then? Let me show you what that looks like. Because in the ascension and the resurrection of Jesus, we see that the church is perfected. So not only is there sympathy for Jesus in the things that are wrong and those that are hurt in his church today, he has this other perspective where there's victory. It won't be like this forever. The day's coming. Perhaps soon we'll be here when there'll be no more scandals, where there'll be no more corruption, where there'll be no more abuse, Will there be no more long extra member meetings? Whatever. The day is coming when we will be with Jesus and we'll be made right forever. Let me show you what that looks like because I want to give you something to hold on to today. Revelation 7. This is where we're headed, church. We're going to be part of this. Hold on. After this, I looked. This is the future. This is eternity. I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen! Blessing and honor and glory and wisdom thanksgiving and power and might be to our God forever and ever. And God's people said, amen. There's victory in Jesus. If you're drawing away from the church, if you're disillusioned, if you're discouraged, understand that Jesus is willing to meet you in that place and to feel the things that you feel but also know that Jesus has this other perspective that I encourage you to ask that he give you. And that is, it's not done yet. The day is coming when everything that's broken will be made right and we will be with Jesus forever. And Jesus invites us all to stand firm and to hold on and to trust him until we get there. Who's in? Something happened that perhaps was newsworthy to you this week. Maybe it wasn't. I've noticed this year in the Metroplex, not many people are paying attention to things other than the horrific drought and biblically plague of temperatures that we've had lately. But you may not have noticed something that happened outside of LA this week. The Dallas Cowboys began training camp. Now, nobody's cheering and clapping. You know why? Because we are embarking on the 27th season without a Super Bowl. 27. I've been a Cowboy fan for 50 years, a diehard Cowboy fan. I have adult kids who have never seen the Cowboys hoist a Super Bowl trophy. Had friends from out of town, some even from Paris this week, and they asked me, hey, we know you're an avid fan. How do you feel about the Cowboys? Meh. Nah.
I've thought about changing. True confession. <laughs> thought about letting go. Yes. There's this guy named Patrick Mahomes. He's, he's from around near Tyler. That's where my mom was born. He's a Red Raider, which is epic. And he's really, really exciting to watch. And the Chiefs are pretty good. Maybe I just need to switch the blue and silver for the red and gold. Or yellow. It looks more yellow than gold. Anyway. It gets worse. I've actually thought about becoming a soccer fan. But a pastor I respect recently said, be careful because soccer is the gateway drug to socialism. <laughs> I, behalf, I apologize on behalf of all you soccer fans who also happen to be capitalists. But imagine this scenario. Imagine that I knew for sure without any reasonable doubt that within five years or 10 years, the Dallas Cowboys would become perfected. They would never lose again. No drop passes, no pre-snap penalties, no missed tackles, no blown assignments, no mishaps off the field like reckless car wrecks and paternity cases, and that's just the owner we're talking about. None of those things that they were gonna win every game from here on out. They would never lose again, and every game they play would be perfect. Per perfect. Why would I give up now? In other words, isn't the beauty of what's going to be sometimes illuminated by the brokenness of the present? I want you to see where we're headed, church. This is our future. Someday, someday when we're made perfect, and we are going to be made perfect, Someday when that happens, we're going to gather together with believers from every time, every tongue, every tribe, every ethnicity, gather around the throne of Jesus and worship him perfectly forever. Can you hold on? For those of you who are disillusioned today, for those of you who are deconstructing, I want you to see two things in Jesus. I want you to see in Jesus you can find sympathy but also in Jesus, you can find victory. Church, that's our future. Who's in? I see that hand. Let's pray. Oh, Father, thank you that you are so good and kind to us, that you didn't leave us alone, but you have made us into a people. And then, Lord, you, instead of staying at a distance and watching your people do their thing, you've entered into our midst and you are present with us through the person of God, the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we welcome you here. Let us continue to enjoy your presence. And God, you've given us a great purpose to fulfill, that we would be supporting the truth, both in the things we proclaim and practice. Father, thank you that you've placed us here and now at this time, because perhaps there's never been a time where there's more opportunity to stand for the truth than there is today. Oh, we pray for our family members and our friends and our loved ones who are disillusioned with the church and are growingly distant and some even deconstructed. As a matter of fact, we just want to silently right now pray for them by name. Lord Jesus, as only you can, come alongside those who are discouraged, those who are distant those who are disillusioned, draw them back to yourself. And as you draw them to yourself, Jesus, bring them home to the family. All for your glory, we pray these things. Amen.